am glad y'all had an awesome spring break. Um, so here's a funny thing. Here's a, here's a funny thing. Um, so 912, the high school ministry is doing Beach Week, and Trey was asking, hey, Tucker, do you have a Hawaiian shirt? And I was like, yeah, I have tons of Hawaiian shirts, right? No, I have one Hawaiian shirt, but you can borrow it. So, excuse me, if he ruins it, we're no longer friends. But I was thinking, I was like, when was the last time I actually wore this Hawaiian shirt? And I wish I had to, I put the picture up there. But the last time I wore the Hawaiian shirt was when we did Beach Week in the 78 last year, or back in 2020, which was the last Wednesday before everything shut down. So I really hope that doesn't happen again and, tr and Trey ruin it for everyone. But I was thinking through, I was thinking through spring break, and this was like, this time last year, we couldn't have gone to the beach. I remember um, us and the adult leader team, we, uh, we go to a leader retreat every Memorial Day weekend, and we didn't know if we were able to go, and that was actually one of the first times we were able to travel, and yes, we were saved, none of us got COVID, but this world is completely different than where it was a year and a half ago, right? I don't say a year, because a year ago, this world is nothing like it was just three months prior, And that's what we're going to be talking about. Over these next two weeks, we're going to be, we are doing a series called Hot Takes. And we're going to be talking about two prevalent things that are happening in your generation, in the world today. I, at this conference, I was listening to a guy. His name's Tim Elmore. And he, um, he's a sociologist. He studies people. He studies social trends. Um, and he's very prominent in the Christian world when it comes to millennials, my age group, and Generation Z, your age group. And at this conference, he, he actually referenced this book, and he called your generation the pandemic population. Because for the rest of your lives, you'll be marked by the pandemic of COVID-19. There will be things that happen in your life that will be impacted by COVID years and years down the road. I was sitting across the table from Shannon, our lead pastor, um, this past Monday, and we were actually sitting, uh, we both got our shots, so let's preface that. We were sitting kind of close, like probably um, about what you guys are sitting in your life groups, and we're like, man, this is too close. Like, this isn't what's normal anymore. See, it's, it's not normal for us to be close physically to people anymore. It's not normal to see people without a mask. See, life has been affected by this pandemic. Everything shut down this time last year. Everybody was in a uh, shelter-in-place order. We couldn't leave our homes. Some of us, we weren't able to see uh, loved ones, family, some of us, we lost loved ones and family. See, there's been some improvements in this pandemic with social distancing, wearing masks, vaccines, but it's still here today. And we are functioning as a society and admitting all of this. See, this pandemic has marked itself in history, and I would argue that the pandemic has left an impact that will change our generations forever. All, out of all of this, there's three questions that people who study generational trends, people who study people, scientists who study people, are asking about your generation because of the pandemic. These three questions are, will they win or lose the battle for mental health? Will the pandemic produce distress or growth? And what narrative will your generation carry with you in the future? And that's what we're going to be talking about today, because I think we need to have an accurate view about this pandemic that we don't like to talk about. I think we need to have an accurate view of this pandemic, but have a positive, hope-filled view forward. So to have this accurate view of a pandemic, we have to understand why a pandemic exists. And some of you are thinking, like, why would God allow this disease, this virus, to run rampant in our world? Why, why? Like, why? What's the why behind this? This doesn't make sense to me. 
So you're back in Genesis, Genesis 3, if you want to flip um, to your Bibles, if you have your phone, Genesis 3. And remember, we spent a lot of time on this earlier in the year. We talked about Genesis 3 is where we see the fall of man, where sin enters into the world, right? And a lot of times we think, man, sin has entered into the world, and now there's a spiritual implication behind it, right? Spiritually, we are affected. Our sin separates us from God. We have this chasm between us that no matter how good of a life we live, no matter how many times we follow the rules, no matter how many times we do the right thing, this divide cannot be, uh, cannot be conquered by us. We think of that, and we're like, man, yes, that's sin. That's why Jesus went to the cross. And if you don't know why, but that's why Jesus went to the cross, to mend and restore the relationship between us and God because of the division we have caused because of our sin. So Genesis 3, it talks about this. It's like, hey, there's spiritual implications of sin. But there's also physical implications of sin. See, in Genesis 3, starting in verse um, 16, it says, Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. Though you will eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. And here's the thing, and this may be a little hard for us to understand, but here's the truth of Scripture. In Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2, God was in the presence of Adam and Eve. We talked about this. Remember, if you didn't, uh, if you weren't with us in our In the Beginning series, go check it out. God was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, which means God can only be in the presence of perfection because God separated, or Adam and Eve separated themselves from God, and God couldn't be in the presence of sin. So for God to be in the presence of Adam and Eve, that means God had, that it had to be perfect. And it was. That's why in the, in the Bible, in Genesis 1, it talks about the creation account. It says, and God saw that it was good. Creation was good, perfect, and new. But what sin did, sin ruined perfection. Spiritually, Adam and Eve were dead because of their disobedience of, from God. And physically, they're no longer perfect. Physically, there is implications of the fall. And actually in verse, I believe it's verse uh, 17. And yes, he said to the man, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you, the ground is cursed because of you. See, we have the curse of sin over the world today. The curse of sin has spiritual implications, division from the Father, and physical implications, disease, cancer, brokenness, and death. This pandemic did not come from God. This pandemic is a result of the curse of sin that we brought into the world. Now that we have a spiritual understanding of why the pandemic is here, because of our sin, because of our brokenness, because of our disobedience from God, we still need a more accurate view of the pandemic. We have um, have to have an accurate view because we have to understand the effects that it has had and that it will have. And I want to talk about this in three categories. Mental health, education, and social. Mental health statistics is 41.1% of households during the COVID pandemic reported symptoms of anxiety disorder or depressive disorder. And this is American statistics. Job loss due to the pandemic has resulted in higher rates of mental illness. There was a higher rate of substance abuse during the pandemic, leading to an increase in considerations of, of suicide. And in the fall of 2020, the CDC reported one in four young adults contemplated suicide. When it comes to education, moving online coupled with inconsistent internet access to a majority of Americans led to to ruined student environment learning. This digital divide has made it virtually impossible for some students to learn during the pandemic. 
I, like, I'll be honest. Um, can I be honest with you guys? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, online church is shallow. It is. And I know some of you, it's, yes, it's convenient when we, um, we can't physically go to church, like our family is unsafe for us to go to church. But I would challenge for the guys who, and girls who are sitting in here right now, I would challenge you, man, consider your view of online church. Yes, live stream is an amazing tool God has used, but it's not true community. Yes, you can worship with us at the same time on Sunday, but you're still behind a screen. See, this education impediment is not only in a physical education, but also a spiritual education. See, because what's happened, and we'll talk about this a lot next week, what's happened is people have turned from Scripture, from large gatherings and church for their truth, and turned to search engines like Google. It's no longer, Mom or Dad, what do you think about it? It's, hey, I'll look it up. For the social implications, some of us haven't been able to see our families. Some of us have lost some of our families. There's been a 25 to 30 percent increase of students who spent more than four hours daily using electronics. And here's some crazy things about what a lot of adults believe to be true about your generation because of the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, 66% of today's adults report a negative rather than a positive emotion when they think about the future of Gen Z. Two-thirds of adults think negatively about you guys because of our response in the middle of this pandemic. 64% of today's adults believe that Generation Z will not be ready for adulthood when they reach it. What's adulthood? 18, taking care of yourself. I don't say that because I believe those things. I say that because we have to understand the, the accurate view that the pandemic has had on these. And these uh, statistics were taken post-pandemic recently, within the past year. So we know these things. Some of us have felt these things. So we have an accurate view of the pandemic. Now, what's the next step? I would challenge you guys and really, really challenge you guys to think on this because this is what I believe is true. There's two decisions to make. This pandemic will cause two, one of two things in a student's life, post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic stress is being in fear of the effects that the pandemic has had. That we've... and. Uh, I hate the word social distancing because I don't believe we need to socially distance from each other. I think we need to talk with each other and we need to be physically pre or socially present and be able to listen to each other. Yes, we may, be, we may need to be physically separated, but not socially distant. We need each other. But the impact that this pandemic has had is to push us into isolation. And when we're in isolation, we get to a dark place. And when we get to a dark place, nothing grows in the dark. Post-traumatic stress because of the year of 2020 due to COVID-19 pandemic will affect us. Or post-traumatic growth. See, and this is, I wish I could go more in depth, but I only have four minutes. Um, suffering can be a catalyst for your spiritual growth and your relationship with Jesus. And that's any kind of suffering. Suffering from a pandemic. Guys, we've all went through suffering this past year. Yeah? Amen? Amen? Amen, dude. We've all gone through suffering because suffering is a result of the brokenness of this world because, again, of the curse of sin. But God can use suffering. He can use hard times. He can use loss. He can use death. He can use these things that may be really hard for us to walk through alone, but in community we can walk through. These things, these hard things, can be an opportunity for us to grow in our relationship with Jesus. And here's why. Here's why suffering can be a catalyst for our spiritual growth. Because in suffering, you will have to make a decision one way or the other. It is, am I going to be totally dependent on me, or am I going to be totally dependent on Jesus? 
Suffering reveals our desperate need for Jesus. It reveals how we need to be dependent on Jesus. It doesn't make sense how this pandemic has ravaged our world. It doesn't. But I'm going, to turn it, I'm going to turn my heart and my worship to the sovereign God who is in control of this. This pandemic was not a surprise to God. This was not an afterthought. He, does, he wasn't caught off by surprise. No, God is using this, this weapon that the enemy wanted for evil, and he is intending to turn it for good for us to spiritually grow in our dependency of him. And, dude, that's, again, that's any suffering. See, this pandemic can be a catalyst for our spiritual growth. Because maybe before this, some of us were stagnant. Some of us, we weren't really growing. Some of us were just in a hard place, maybe. Maybe we were having questions, maybe we were having doubts, and questions and doubts are not bad, they're good things. But maybe it took this past year for us to realize how desperately we need Jesus. Maybe it took loss, death, suffering for us to grow in our dependency of Jesus. Maybe it took months of quarantine for us to realize we need biblical community. Yes, we have an accurate view of the pandemic, but we have to have an accurate view on our future that is fueled by hope, by God's grace. Because for us to have an accurate view of both the pandemic and life, post-pandemic, we have that can be post-traumatic growth we have to have an accurate view of God. And in my, um, in my personal study, I've been in Psalm 62. And I think, or I believe, Psalm 62 is a great place for us to land tonight. When, it, when we look to have an accurate view of God, but an accurate view of our worship to God in the middle of hard times. The psalm, it says in verse 1, and this is, again, this is a psalm of David. It says, I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. See, when David is proclaiming his victory in verse 1, he is identifying that his victory comes from God. He is, identify, he is identifying that his victory is Jesus. So that's my question to you, is what is your victory? What do you consider to be a win? What do, you con- what do you consider to be an achievement? Is it you are growing in your relationship with Jesus? You're growing in your spiritual life. You're growing in your faith journey. Is that a win to you? Or is your win, hey, I'm going to try to figure this out on my own, and I'm going to come to the cl- conclusion by myself, for myself, through myself. See, David says, I wait quietly before God because my victory comes from him. And by waiting quietly, we are surrendering our lives to what God may do in our lives. It keeps going in verse 2. It says, He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I'll never be shaken. There is safety and security in the cross and gospel of Jesus. Verse 3, it says, So many enemies against one man, all of them trying to kill me. To them I'm just a broken down wall or a tottering fence. They plan to topple me from a high position. They delight in telling lies about me. They praise me to my face but curse me in their hearts. David is talking about a very difficult situation, a very difficult season in life. And look at his response to that. Because of this hard thing that's happening in my life, let all that I am wait quietly before God. For my hope is in him. Again, it's about surrendering ourselves to Jesus. With all that I am, I am waiting quietly. I am waiting obediently to see what Christ is going to do through me and in me. Verse 6, he alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I'll never be shaken. Again, there's a safety and security. My victory and honor come from him. Oh, my people, trust him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. So my last question to you guys, and you'll be able to talk about these questions in your life group, is this. How are you running to the Father? If you know he is your refuge, your rock, your salvation, your place of refuge, how are you running to him? How are you pursuing him? Are you pursuing Jesus? Again, 
the pandemic has hurt us. Okay, but we talked about it last week or two weeks ago. God is in the healing business. He's in the restoring business. He's in the redeeming bu- business. He's in the reconciliation business. Dude, Jesus is going to do something through this. But how are you surrendering your life to him? What is your definition of victory? And how are you running to him, trusting in him in that? Let's pray. God, we love you. God, we thank, again, thank you for your sovereignty, your complete control and authority in not just my life, God, but in all of our lives, God. God, you will allow bad things to happen for us to grow in you, God. And God, I pray that in these hard times, in these sufferings, God, that, that we look to how good you are, how comforting you are, and how in complete control you are, God. God, yes, this past year has hurt, but God, you are bigger than a pandemic. And God, that we pray that we are reminded of that, and we praise that and worship that, God. We love you. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.